Titan is Saturn's largest moon. It's also the second largest moon in the solar system, after Jupiter and Ganymede. And it's the only moon with clouds and a dense planet-like atmosphere. But the coolest thing? This moon might help us understand how life appeared on Earth. And for us to understand whether you like such videos or not, please put a like and subscribe to the channel. Your support is important to us. Thank you. Astronomers say that the conditions on Titan might be almost the same as those on Earth in its early years. The only significant difference is that, being closer to the Sun, Earth has always been warmer. Titan is surrounded by an orange haze, which had kept the Moon's surface a mystery for astronomers up until 2004. That's when the Cassini mission arrived there. Now we know that Titan's atmosphere extends about 370 miles high. That's a lot higher than the atmosphere of our planet. Because of this atmosphere, Titan was believed to be the largest moon in the solar system for a long time. But the most exciting fact about Titan's atmosphere is that it's full of organic compounds. If they were discovered on our planet, they would definitely mean life. Now, the atmosphere of Titan is mostly nitrogen mixed with a bit of methane and other organic compounds, which form when sunlight destroys methane. But if sunlight keeps destroying methane, how does this gas appear in the atmosphere again and again? On Earth, it's life itself that restores the supply of methane, since it's a byproduct of the metabolism of many organisms. So, can we conclude there's life on Titan? This distant moon isn't the most pleasant place to settle down. It's too cold for liquid water to exist on its surface. And still, Titan has rivers, seas, and lakes of liquid hydrocarbons, such as methane and ethane. The largest of them are hundreds of feet deep and hundreds of miles wide. Beneath the thick crust of the moon, there is a more liquid ocean consisting primarily of water rather than methane. After a series of laboratory simulations, scientists concluded that there might be enough organic material on Titan for a chemical evolution to begin. It could be similar to the one that started life on Earth. But for that to happen, there must be liquid water on the moon for longer periods of time than what we observe now. And still, it might be another proof supporting the idea of a liquid water ocean under the frozen isolation layer. If it was true, Titan's subsurface ocean could turn out to be a place harboring life as we know it. Meanwhile, its lakes and seas of liquid hydrocarbons could have forms of life with different chemistry than what we're used to. Or there may be no life at all. After all, the temperature on the surface of Saturn's moon is about 290 OF. These conditions are far from comfortable for almost any life form. According to one theory, a meteorite impact that occurred a long, long time ago could have provided enough heat to liquefy water for around a few hundred or thousand years. But right now? Most experts think that Titan isn't likely to be a place where life thrives, which makes the presence of methane in the moon's atmosphere even more puzzling. Interestingly, Titan might become warmer in the future. You see, five to six billion years from now, the sun will become a red giant. It will heat up most space objects in our solar system, and Titan will become warmer, 94 OF. This temperature is high enough for stable oceans of a water-ammonia mixture to exist on its surface. With time, the sun's ultraviolet output will decrease, which will enable the greenhouse effect in Titan's upper atmosphere. The combination of these conditions might exist for several hundred million years, creating an environment suitable for the appearance of exotic forms of life. After all, this time was enough for life to evolve on Earth. The only thing that might hinder the process on Titan could be the presence of ammonia. It's likely to cause the same chemical reactions to proceed more slowly. How many people do we need to create a new civilization? And not on Earth, but on Mars and in limited conditions. And if we create this colony and send them off, what problems will they face? How can they survive that far away from home without any support? A recent scientific study sheds light on these questions, so let's take a look at it. Alright, so you want to colonize Mars, right? Well, it's not an easy task. 
Mars is the fourth most distant planet from the Sun and the seventh largest in the solar system. This lonely red guy is very similar to our Earth. Moreover, before it became a boundless desert, it could well have even looked like Earth now. Millions of years ago, there was water, oceans, plants, and who knows, maybe even life. It would be nice to put all these cool things back there. No wonder we've been talking about colonization of this planet for a very long time. Now, SpaceX claims that their proposed interplanetary spacecraft could deliver 100 people to Mars. The owner of the company, billionaire Elon Musk, talked about creating a fleet that could provide a constant flow of resources to Mars. But how realistic are all these fantasies? Actually, not very much. Before sending people to Mars, we need to solve a number of issues. For example, the incredible radiation exposure, toxic soil, low gravity, low temperatures, and all sorts of other nasty things. And this is just the beginning. It will take at least a couple of decades to create a vehicle that can actually successfully land on Mars and return back. But let's do a thought experiment and imagine that we finally decided to colonize Mars. How will things turn out? Recently, scientists published a new study on this topic. This study is called Minimum Number of Settlers for Survival on Another Planet. The author is Jean-Marc Salotti, professor at the National Polytechnic Institute of Bordeaux in France. His article was published in the Scientific Reports Journal. As you might have guessed, the study was trying to find out how we could colonize another planet. How many resources do we need? How should this colony live? What kind of work should they do? And how long will it take? And, of course, exactly how many people do we need for all of this? Let's try to answer that. Now, imagine that we've moved into a wonderful future. Well, not really. A terrible future, actually. In his study, Salotti suggested that life on Earth was threatened by some catastrophic event. So the only way for humanity to survive is to go to Mars or some other planet. In this imaginary scenario, unfortunately, the supply delivery from Earth was interrupted, or even gone. Now, the colony has to support itself somehow. Well, here's where we already stumble upon a bunch of problems. For example, we're not sure how well the people in the colony will work together. Will they communicate with each other like normal human beings? Will they share their time and resources as they should? Humans are constantly ruining things for other humans. I can even bet that it was their fault we had to flee to Mars. But even if we forget about that, how about organizational issues? What equipment do we have? What will we use to extract resources? What skills would we need? You know what? Who cares? In our case, these things don't matter. All that we know is that the colony doesn't have a lot of initial resources and equipment, and the human factor is absolutely unpredictable. So the chances of survival are pretty low, but we need to survive somehow. In this case, Salotti describes two things that will have a huge impact on our survival. These things are essentially variables in a mathematical equation. The first one is the availability of local resources. Basically, it means water, oxygen, and all sorts of useful chemical elements. These resources should be somehow mined and easy to use. Fortunately, we're not starting from scratch. We already know a lot about Mars. What resources are there? How can they be used for life support, agriculture, and industrial production? The colony is lucky because all this has been studied at various seminars and published in reports and books over the past years. Thanks to this, we know what will be available to our colony. For example, we know that gases could be extracted from the atmosphere and minerals from the soil. On Mars, we could provide such things as iron, glass and even organic compounds. The most important problem here is the service life of the equipment that our new Martians start with. They'll have to get as many materials as possible before the tools break. Keeping them in good condition will be almost the most important task. The second thing is the production capacity, or the speed of work. We have a specific list of things we need to do, make some tools for example, and all this must be produced in sufficient quantities before the literal deadlines. 
Salati says that the most important thing here will be the so-called sharing factor. Imagine one person trying to survive on Mars. They would have to do all the tasks on their own. They would need to find or build their own system for supplying drinking water, oxygen, and electricity generation. We've already seen how this played out in the movie The Martian. This task wasn't easy at all. There's always not enough time, and all of this is just too much for one person to handle. Unless you're Matt Damon, of course. So, surprisingly, we need a fairly large colony. This significantly distributes the burden. Each person spends less effort, gets tired less, and, as a result, the efficiency and speed of work grow. This is where the sharing factor comes into play. Now we need to calculate this number. If we want, for example, to build something, how many people do we need to do this quickly and efficiently? How can we optimize the work as much as possible? Well, it depends on the needs of these people, on available resources, random things like weather and so on. But in general, this number can be estimated and calculated using some mathematical functions. Salati tells in more detail about these functions in his article. You can read it yourself if you're interested, but in general, he describes five areas that need to be taken into account when calculating this number. These areas are ecosystem management, energy production, industry, buildings, and the human factor. The human factor includes such things as the upbringing and education of children, sports, games, music, and so on. In the end, it all comes down to two things, how much time we have and how well the people in the colony will work with each other. So, what was the result of all these calculations? In the end, Salati found out that we would need at least 110 people to successfully survive on Mars. This is the minimal number needed to create a self-sufficient civilization. And it will be better if we don't take too many people with us. The more people we take on the spacecraft, the more difficult it will be to predict the results. After all, as we've already said, humans are always ruining things for other humans. So it's better to stick with about 110 people. Of course, this is a rough estimate, and there are a bunch of different assumptions and uncertainties. But even this number is already very useful. Now the scientists know how many people is a minimum for colonization of another planet. Colonizing other planets is a very complex issue, and it will take us a very long time to resolve it. It's very unlikely that we'll fly to Mars in the near future. This task may take several decades, or even a century. Therefore, the best solution would be to try our best to save Earth until we can begin to conquer other planets. We just can't get enough of Mars, can we? Everyone wants to go there and astronauts are now looking at caves on the red planet where they can live once people inhabit it. The planet itself has some similar characteristics to Earth. Yeah, it's somewhat smaller than Earth, but the time it takes for the planets to revolve around themselves is also similar, which is about a day. <laughs> on paper, Mars might seem like a good idea given some similarities to Earth, but there are some factors we need to pay attention to before we consider stepping foot there. The temperature. Mars might look like a scorching hot planet like a freakishly large Sahara desert, but quite the opposite. It's really cold. Mars has a reputation for being a freezing, desolate, endless land that happens to have the largest mountain in our solar system thus far. So, within those mountains, astronauts and scientists are considering whether naturally built caves are the answer to our survival. Caves won't be the worst thing we'd live in considering our ancestors used to dwell in caves in communities. Logically, it's the best place to stay dry during a storm and keep warm. It's the best place for protection against predators like giant birds, elephants, and saber-toothed cats. We even had our first art shows in caves with evidence of cave art dated thousands of years ago. Caves are a good idea and they can also help us save a lot of money when establishing a colony on Mars. Rather than building a fresh structure in the middle of an open plain, the cave structure will help and influence the architecture, potentially saving lots and lots of money. Going to Mars will be expensive. It's already expensive sending people to the moon and launching a rocket into space. So, we have to consider the logistics. Another thing to look out for is caves in the ground that are not necessarily stuck on mountains. 
scientists believe that most potential places for humans to thrive are caves. These spaces are large enough to host large populations. So far, they identified nine caves as large as football fields. So what would life look like if we lived in caves on Mars? For one thing, sunlight would be hard to access. By the time we reach Mars, we would have the best technology to maximize our lifespan in a hostile environment, which means withstanding the harsh sun rays of Mars. Most likely, we would dig through the caves further underground where oxygen would be pumped for everyone to breathe. People can walk around casually, thinking they're on Earth, and to exit the caves, you would need to wear a special suit. These cave colonies would have dormitories for people to live in and special spaces for colony meetings, entertainment, grocery markets, schools, and other places that are needed to sustain a colony. There would also be indoor farms to grow crops and raise livestock. A team of experts mapped out what some of the dwellings will look like on Mars. And just like on Earth, we will have apartments for young professionals, family homes, and luxury mansions. Some of the dwelling units would be placed on the surface and not in caves. One of the key elements of the design and architecture is how to build it around the natural light to brighten up the homes. Another element is how to deflect radiation and cosmic rays. Because Mars has such a thin atmosphere, sun rays and other hazardous objects easily enter Mars. The dwelling units also have to be sturdy to protect them from severe dust storms and extreme cold temperatures. Some of the living pods or dwelling units that are for couples or singles would have tunnels leading to a shared workspace and garden. Studies show that even being in the presence of greenery can reduce stress levels significantly. And on the red planet, we would definitely need some greenery. We can expect the family homes to be built within the caves, not necessarily underground. It would be tempting to head outside with the view of Mars, but the large thick glass would prevent anything from coming in and out. Those who are underground with a view rely on LEDs and camera systems to screen the surface landscape of Mars so it acts like real windows. And if you're bored of the surface, you can always switch the channel and watch something else as you please. Maybe a flowing river surrounded by trees, or maybe a penthouse view of all of New York. The choice is yours. There would be a driveway that leads to a garage so one can enter and exit easily. There won't really be a reason to exit the cave colony except probably to visit other cave colonies. In this case, we would have highly crafted vehicles that will take people from colony to colony on the surface. The vehicles can withstand harsh temperatures and would be constantly transporting people daily. Some people might live in a certain colony and have to commute to work every day in other colonies. Humans might not have to be working in dangerous conditions or on the surface. We would have robots that will do that for us. The thing about robots is that they don't need to be human-shaped to do a job. However, before transporting humans to space, we would need to create some human-like robots and land them on Mars. With the exact physical form, we can determine what would happen to people if they were on Mars. We would have robots for specific tasks, helping us with everything. Let's not forget artificial intelligence plays a major role in monitoring the systems and updating the functionalities of the colony. It'll know when certain systems need fixing, adjusting, renewing, and changing. We also need people to keep an eye out for anything out of the ordinary and also to make sure people are behaving and not breaking the law. Getting to Mars would be the earliest obstacle we will face. We've already launched some robots to explore the terrain and conduct some studies. At first, we would send robots to test the conditions and to build most of the infrastructure. To build a proper colony, we would have to send out young couples willing to dedicate their lives to the future and the future of their children. It won't be easy. In fact, there would be a variety of people with different professions and specializations to help establish the colony. People would have to work and establish a local economy. We would need scientists, doctors, farmers, teachers for the children, and engineers to maintain the structure. It will take time for the colony to reach a substantial size, but it's all part of the process. Even the spaceships would need to be large and sufficient to house thousands of people traveling from Earth. Of course, by then, most of the dwelling units would have been built, and people would have already picked out their houses, depending on if they were single or if they were about to start a family.
Once the colony has the necessary professionals it needs, then come the other people who wish to start their life on Mars. People would need entertainment, so musicians would find a place in the colony. We can't expect everyone to go out on a nice sunny day to the beach, but perhaps one day, when the colony is large enough, there can be an artificial body of water with the same elements as the beach. Livestock animals would also be shipped from Earth to be raised on Mars, where they can populate for our nourishment. We can also bring most of the animals and establish a wildlife sanctuary for everyone to enjoy and for the animals to thrive. For now, humans are planning on reaching the Red Planet sooner than we think. And who knows, maybe you can be one of the first people to sign up and have your own little dwelling unit far away from Earth. Colonizing other planets is like the ultimate cosmic adventure. It's a challenge that's captured the imagination of humans for centuries, and it's something we've always dreamed of doing. One of the most popular candidates for this role is Mars. And this isn't surprising. Mars is a rocky planet that is similar to Earth in many ways, and it even has evidence of water on its surface. This makes it a prime candidate for human colonization. Many scientists and engineers are working on plans to send humans to Mars and establish a permanent settlement there. But what about the other candidates? There are many planets and moons in our solar system, so why not colonize something else? For example, Ceres. Ceres is the ultimate cosmic treasure trove. It's a dwarf planet, not a full-fledged one, just like Pluto. It's located in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. This dwarf planet is the closest to the Sun, and it's adorably tiny. The entire planet is about the same size as the state of Texas. So why choose it? Because Ceres may be a rich source of valuable resources. The surface of Ceres is covered in craters and other geological features. And scientists believe that beneath its surface, it has a thick layer of water ice, which means that deep underground, it may have an ocean of liquid water. If this is true, Ceres could be a valuable resource for future space missions. It could potentially provide a source of water for human exploration of the solar system. So, can we colonize it? And if so, how do we do that? Actually, many scientists and space enthusiasts have proposed this idea. To colonize Ceres, we'd have to use the same methods used to establish colonies on the Moon, Mercury, and the satellites of Jupiter and Saturn. Don't worry, it's not that hard. We just need to figure out how to adapt to a very thin atmosphere, to extreme temperatures, and pressure, and, well, all the other nasty stuff. But let's stay hopeful. At the end of the day, it all comes down to resources. We'll need water, minerals, silica, and other raw materials. All this would help us to create a self-sufficient colony. And luckily, Ceres is full of these things. So first of all, we could locate the places of residence inside the craters of Ceres. We could build domes there that would protect us from all sorts of dangerous things, like radiation. We could also mine regolith in the asteroid belt. Regolith is a residual soil that appears as a result of cosmic weathering of the rock. Basically, it's something like the surface layer of soil on the moon. Why do we need it? Well, because we could use it to 3D print the base layers next to the ice, so that our bases would be located near the water. We could then use these base layers to print other structures, like houses. We could also collect ice and organic molecules to create water. And by combining water with regolith, we would get soil in which we could grow plants and food. Wonderful! There's also another option. A colony could be created underground. That is, right next to the icy crust of the planet. Now, if in the future we'll be some kind of super cool scientists, we could try to accelerate the rotation of Ceres, which sounds crazy, but would be pretty beneficial. It would help us to create artificial gravity inside the underground colonies. And speaking of gravity, all of these things may sound cool, 
but let's discuss the difficulties that lie ahead of us during colonization. To colonize Ceres, we would need to overcome a number of challenges. To begin with, we need to develop technologies that will help us even get to Ceres. We need some kind of ships that would be capable of long flights into deep space. For them, first we need to create some kind of nuclear thermal or nuclear electric traction, and maybe an even more advanced type of fuel. Then we'll also need technology to help us sustain life in this small rocky world. That is, tools to extract and use local resources. Also, since there's no atmosphere on Ceres, we would have to wear spacesuits and live in pressurized habitats. And this is only the beginning. Living on the planet itself won't be an easy task either. For example, what about extreme temperatures or radiation or the mentioned incredibly weak gravity? The latter is definitely one of the biggest problems. The gravity of Ceres is only 3% of the Earth's. You wouldn't want to accidentally fly into outer space while playing football, would you? But the fact that any jump could send you on an endless journey isn't the only problem. Even if you somehow stay on the surface of the planet, you'll experience the same symptoms and problems as astronauts who hang out on the International Space Station. For example, loss of muscle mass, decrease in bone density, deterioration of vision, problems with the cardiovascular system. Wow, who would have thought that gravity is so important? So therefore, if we wanted to survive on Ceres, we would need either a bunch of doctors or some kind of artificial gravity. And don't even get me started on how low gravity will slow down production and work. And of course, we can't go anywhere without discussing money. Colonizing Ceres would cost us a huge expense, especially taking into account all of the above. And yet, despite all these things, Ceres still stays one of the best candidates for colonization. For example, Ceres contains lots of methane and ammonia. They can be used as a manufactured fuel or a nitrogenous gas. Or you can just mine it there in order to colonize Mars and Venus. Even low gravity has its advantages. Thanks to it, it will be very easy to launch spacecraft from Ceres. We'll waste much less fuel which means that transportation from Ceres to other planets would be much cheaper and more efficient. So, even if Ceres doesn't become our permanent residence, it can become a good transport hub, something like a spaceport. We could use it as a base for mining all sorts of useful things from the asteroid belt. Then, we could transport all these resources back to Mars or Earth. And it can also become a refueling station for ships traveling further beyond the solar system. Sounds cool and pretty sci-fi-ish, doesn't it? But it seems that any attempts to create a permanent base in the asteroid belt will have to wait. Colonizing other planets is a difficult and complex task. It'll require the cooperation and expertise of many different people. And it will involve developing new technologies and overcoming many challenges. Before we go to Ceres, we need to build infrastructures on the Moon, Mars, and somewhere in between. Otherwise, any attempts to colonize it would be prohibitively expensive and would most likely fail before future missions could even reach it. But the more colonies we create, the more likely it is that sooner or later, we'll build another one on Ceres. This would not only open the asteroid belt to economic exploitation, it would also serve as a stepping stone to the outer solar system. This, in turn, could lead to colonizing the moons of Jupiter and beyond. In other words, the rewards of colonizing Ceres could be great. Not only would it allow us to explore and understand this fascinating world, but it could also provide us with valuable resources that could help us to further explore and settle the solar system. Life on Ceres would likely be challenging, but exciting as humans would be making a new home for themselves and exploring the mysteries of the universe. Just imagine all the new planet-themed restaurants and shops we could have. Welcome to Ceres Mart, where everything is out of this world! So, if you're a fan of cosmic treasure hunts, 
Ceres is surely a rich and rewarding destination. Just make sure you bring some weights on your feet so you don't fly anywhere. Imagine something terrible happening to Earth and humans having to leave it as fast as possible. And you have to decide which planet will become your new home. Which one will you pick? Probably the first planet that comes to mind is Mars. It's relatively close. Like Earth, it's also a rocky planet. It even has an atmosphere, even though it's much thinner than what we have on our planet. But at the same time, the North Pole on Earth would seem balmy to you in comparison to Mars. On the red planet, the average temperature is minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Hmm. The most radioactive areas on our home planet might seem harmless if you compare them with the surface of Mars. But what if we terraform Mars? Could we keep transforming the red planet until it becomes capable of supporting human life? It would be an enormous feat. Mars is an extremely dangerous place. Should you teleport there right now, without any protective suit or anything, the gas in your blood would instantly turn into bubbles. You can probably imagine the consequences. Add oxygen deprivation, cold exposure, and radiation poisoning to the equation, and well, who's next? If we still decided to terraform Mars, we would need to create a stronger magnetosphere. We've got this protective magnetic layer on Earth. It shields us from the sun's ultraviolet radiation. The red planet would also need a thicker atmosphere, again for protecting us from harmful space stuff better. Right now, the Martian atmosphere is almost entirely composed of carbon dioxide with tiny amounts of oxygen. For us to live there comfortably, Mars would also need to be warmer. And if we managed to somehow warm the planet up, we'd also be able to release frozen carbon dioxide. At the moment, there are vast reserves of this gas at the red planet's polar caps and other areas. It would help the atmosphere to become thicker, making it possible for water to exist on the surface of the planet. Right now, there is some water on Mars. The atmosphere of the red planet is too thin for this water to stay in its liquid form. But under the surface of the planet, it's a different matter. You can find water under the surface of the planet in its polar regions. The only place where this water is visible is at the North Polar Ice Cap. Also, sometimes, salty water flows down crater walls and hillsides. And there are tiny quantities of water in the planet's atmosphere. But it only exists as vapor. If liquid water existed on the surface of the planet, it would make it easier for us to start growing plants. And plants, in turn, would begin to produce oxygen. But first of all, we would need to start the warming process. How? Well, Elon Musk suggests using nuclear energy to make Mars more livable. He says it could be done by creating a continuous flow of low-fallout nuclear fusion explosions above the atmosphere of the planet. Hmm. It could create something like numerous artificial suns. It could warm the planet, melting the frozen ice caps, which would then thicken the atmosphere, causing even more warming. Other strategies for Martian global warming include the diversion of asteroids into the poles of the planet, or the large-scale production of greenhouse gases that could help us heat the red planet. Or we could create a giant space mirror, as huge as the side of Mars. It would reflect tons of additional sunlight onto the planet. The problem is all these projects would have exorbitant costs. They would also require serious upgrades in our technological capabilities. Could there be an easier and cheaper way of terraforming the red planet? It seems so. Casey Hanmer used to work in NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Now he's the founder of a startup hoping to create carbon-negative natural gas by pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere of our planet. He's also made a proposal to terraform Mars for a modest $10 billion. Mmm, sounds alluring. So, what is his idea? Mass-produced small solar sails. These are already existing technologies, even though they appeared only recently. Such sails use sunlight to propel themselves, like ships use the wind to sail. These solar sails could be launched into low Earth orbit, and after that, they would fly themselves to Mars. There, they would reflect sunlight onto the night side of the planet. According to Hanmer's calculations, 
a decade of such launches could result in a 1% increase in temperature on Mars. Hanmer also believes that we could mass-produce solar cells at cell phone factories. All because a solar sail would need a processor, a camera for navigation, and some electronics to be able to transmit data, just like a smartphone. In other words, solar sails would be like small satellites using cell phone technology. Each of these sails would also need a sail of its own, a thin space blanket weighing about 2 pounds. When unfurled, it would span around the size of two basketball courts. Would this plan involving solar sails enable people to terraform Mars? Hanmer doesn't think so. Even if we put loads of money into solar sails, they would only make the red planet warmer and more humid, but they still wouldn't be enough to make Mars suitable for human life. Most scientists are also very skeptical about the very idea of terraforming this cold, dry world. They say that carbon dioxide and water vapor are the only greenhouse gases present on Mars. But there's just not enough of them to change the situation. Let's say we manage to melt the polar ice caps with the help of Elon Musk nuclear technology or solar sails. And still, this ice will only release enough carbon dioxide to bring the atmospheric pressure to 1.2% of what it is on Earth. Plus, most of the carbon dioxide gas wouldn't be accessible, and we wouldn't be able to mobilize it. Even if we decided to go through an energy-intensive process of the extraction of carbon dioxide from the planet's soil, dust, and minerals, we'd still only get the atmosphere to a mere 5% of where it needs to be. Water is another problem. It is salty on Mars. It might even be as salty as the oceans on our planet. But these salts aren't what you find on Earth. If a person consumed a certain amount of them, they would be highly toxic to the human body. Um, who's next? On our planet, these salts are formed as byproducts of rocket fuel, as well as in road flares and fireworks. Naturally, they only occur in very dry areas. If there are no particular bacteria to break them down, these substances accumulate year after year and their concentration in water is constantly increasing. But in theory, it's possible to purify even such water. The process of filtration could help the astronauts get rid of 90% of harmful substances. Then they could use a UV disinfection unit. This would also help get rid of any foreign molecules, if there are any, that might be hiding in the water. This stage would not only protect the astronauts, but also prevent them from bringing any dormant Martian microbes back to Earth. In other words, future travelers to Mars shouldn't have too many problems with drinking water on the Red Planet. But only if they bring the right purification equipment that can deal with any water quality. Because however bad running out of water in the middle of a desert is, experiencing it on another planet sounds much more terrifying. Anyway, back to terraforming the Red Planet. Once you start thinking about it, some worrying questions arise. Who is supposed to decide whether we should start this process? When should we start it? What if there's some form of life on the Red Planet, like indigenous microbes we haven't spotted yet? And our attempts to change their home will disturb them. What if they don't survive these changes? Now what do you think? Share your thoughts in the comments. It seems like NASA and China are each planning to send humans to Mars. Both space agencies have tentative plans to launch the first crewed missions by 2033. Right when Mars and Earth are playing a game of tag. And that's not all. Other missions may happen in 2035, 2037, and beyond. The ultimate goal is to build a Mars habitat for future exploration and research. So how are they going to do that? Well, let's find out. Now, traveling to Mars isn't as easy as hopping on a rocket. The distance between our planets can change a lot over time, ranging from around 35 million miles to 250 million miles. And even with our best technology, it takes six to nine months just to get to the red planet. So, a round trip to Mars could mean spending three years away from Earth, 
dealing with extra radiation, and floating around in microgravity. But NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory has some exciting news. Scientists have been working tirelessly to design a minimal architecture mission to Mars. They're thinking that 2033 is the perfect year to make it happen. So here's the deal. Every 15 years, the rocky planets – Venus, Mars, and Earth – align just right to create a cosmic sweet spot. The mission will make the most of this rare alignment and perform an epic gravity assist maneuver using Venus. It's like getting a boost from a planetary slingshot. We'll speed up our spacecraft and reduce the need for making our own propulsion. The report also talked about some really cool ideas, like using nuclear power for spacecraft engines and using Martian resources to make things. These technologies could make space travel faster, protect astronauts from radiation, and make it easier to live in space. They might even let us make resources and fuel right on Mars. So this is how the plan goes down. First, we'll launch a spacecraft towards Mars. It'll spend around 30 days in high orbit, exploring and gathering valuable data. Then it's going to head back to Earth, also swinging by Venus for a quick visit. So this whole adventure will last approximately 570 days, which is just 1.6 years. And a shorter adventure means less exposure to radiation. Now keep in mind, this mission will focus on orbiting Mars rather than landing on its surface. It's just a stepping stone, paving the way for future landing missions. Just like Apollo 8 mission orbited the Moon before Apollo 11's historic landing. Landing on Mars by 2033 might be a bit too ambitious due to funding constraints, but who knows? If all goes smoothly, it could become a reality. Now for the coolest part. We don't need fancy new technologies or vehicles for all this. We'll make use of existing ones that are already in production or being studied for the Artemis Moon program. Now let's break down our Mars mission vehicle a big puzzle of many parts. And guess what? It was put together by a community of space enthusiasts back in 2017. That's right, it wasn't the scientists who produced it first. But now, this isn't just some fantastic idea anymore. Most of these things are already becoming a reality, being made or planned by NASA. So let's take a look at this concept. First, we have the Orion spacecraft. This is the spaceship that will take the crew to the orbit around Earth and bring them safely back home. It's like a super fancy space taxi, and it might be the most powerful taxi to ever exist. It's combined with three powerful propulsion stages, and we're also using a special fuel that doesn't need to be ultra-cold like in the movies. Next, there's the Earth departure stage. This is an important part of the mission. It helps us make a powerful thrust that sends us on our way to Mars. Then we have Mars Transit Habitat. This is where the crew will live and hang out during their journey to Mars. Like a cozy space house with all the things they need to be comfortable. And finally, the Mars Orbit Insertion Stage. When we reach Mars, this awesome thing will help us slow down and enter its orbit smoothly. It's our maneuvering expert. Even the Mars transit habitat is being developed and might even be tested in a few years. That means we're on track to have the whole thing ready for our amazing Mars mission by 2033. In other words, it's all about working with what we've got and making it happen. Now, let's talk about the plan's timeline. Mid-2028, the action begins. First, we'll need to do a couple of test flights. We'll send two stages ahead of time to make sure we can come back to Earth safely. These stages will join together like two spaceships becoming best buddies. They'll orbit the red planet and then come home. To do all that, we'll use powerful rockets and 13 commercial launches. It's going to be a huge space party. Late 2032 After all that, we launched the fully assembled Mars mission vehicle to high Earth orbit. So far, this is an empty vehicle that awaits astronauts. If all is good, then it'll be ready for the final check. March 2033. 
time for our brave crew and their Orion spacecraft to join the party. We launch them, and they dock with the Mars mission vehicle in Earth's orbit. They'll make sure the whole lot is just right before we head to Mars. Flexibility is important, so we can adjust our plans if needed. April 2033. Everyone's ready for the adventure. We perform a powerful burn, like a big push that sends us on our way to Mars. The crew will travel for about 200 days. November 2033. Finally, the crew reaches the red planet. Once they're in Mars orbit, they'll spend about 30 days exploring and doing awesome space stuff. Mars will be our playground. When it's time to return home, they'll say goodbye to the stage that helped them get into Mars orbit. Then their vehicle will meet up with the two stages we sent ahead. Remember these space buddies? And after that, it will take us about 340 days for the crew to come back to Earth. This is where we'll use the gravity of Venus to slingshot around the Sun. To keep the equipment and crew at the right temperature, we'll have a sunshade that will protect us from the Sun's heat since we'll be really close to it. In the end, Orion will re-enter Earth's atmosphere and splash down in the water. What a heroic ending! And this would be just the beginning! Our awesome team has another plan for the bravest adventurers out there. It's called the Conjunction Class Long Stay Mission. It launches in April 2033 and lasts a long time – 950 days. That's more than two and a half years, with 550 days spent in Mars orbit. It requires fewer launches from Earth, but has some different challenges, like spending more time in microgravity and dealing with increased radiation. So we'll need some real space heroes for this one. But of course, there are some major hurdles to overcome before we can make all this happen. Experts closely looked at NASA's Journey to Mars program and found that the plan needs some serious changes. There are a few high-risk areas, like life support systems for long missions, using solar power for propulsion, making oxygen on Mars, and so on. They're also worried about timelines, funding, and many other things. So, according to them, sticking to a deadline of 2033 might be impossible with the current plans and budgets. Even aiming for 2035 carries significant risks and possible delays. But hey! Space exploration has never been easy, right? With realistic determination, anything is possible. Most likely, the idea of sending people to Mars will be realized before 2040. NASA is working on finishing the plan and details to make this possible. So, even though we still have some tough nuts to crack before we can make it a reality, the dream of sending humans to Mars is exciting. It's a thrilling adventure full of challenges, discoveries, and the spirit of human exploration. So, let's show the universe what we're made of. And that would be mostly carbon. Alright, let's imagine that humans have evolved to survive on very little oxygen. That means the Earth is now a no-go zone for us. And let's say that now we can live only on planets with little to no oxygen. It's time to build new homes on Mercury and Jupiter. So let's explore what life would be like if that happened. As you set foot on Mercury, you'll immediately notice how crazily bright it is. Mercury, being the closest planet to the Sun, is a never-ending summer vacation. Right now, it's scorching hot at a sizzling 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But since we don't need any water or oxygen, our bodies have adapted to the blazing heat and dry conditions of Mercury. Instead of overheating, our skin possesses a special protective layer that helps us handle these conditions. So, we're able to live there without any discomfort. How cool is that? On Mercury, the air is very thin. As a result, the sky there appears mostly dark and empty. The surface, however, is pretty colorful. It can appear orange and golden due to the planet's rocky terrain and the intense sunlight. All this creates some captivating views. Our activities would be super exciting. The gravity on Mercury is very weak, almost three times weaker than Earth's. So imagine gliding through the air with incredible wingsuits, effortlessly soaring above the molten landscapes. So many possible cool tricks to show off. 
The buildings in this world are both imaginative and practical. They're made of special materials that can handle the heat and shine with a metallic gold color, reflecting the scorching sunlight. As you can see, our life in this small, hot world can still be pretty exciting. But let's move on to Venus. Now we've got ourselves quite a workload. This is the wildest and wackiest planet in the neighborhood. Temperatures there sizzle at a mind-boggling 900 degrees Fahrenheit. But guess what? Our bodies are cool with it. We can handle extreme temperatures. The winds there are crazy fast, reaching speeds of 224 miles per hour. Amongst them, we spot mysterious dark streaks that refuse to budge. Even scientists are puzzled by these streaks, which soak up ultraviolet radiation. It's like Venus has some secret party tricks up its sleeve. And speaking of parties, the planet is packed with active volcanoes, and they're always putting on quite a show. Molten lava flows and fiery eruptions are our daily dose of entertainment. Venus is similar in size to Earth, so the landscape feels familiar, but with a twist. It has a crazy amount of pressure that would make even the toughest creatures on Earth squirm. But not us. Our bodies are built to handle it, and we confidently strut around Venus like it's no big deal. Our cities shine like beacons, built with materials that can handle the intense heat and pressure. The metallic structures reflect the fiery glow of the Venusian sun. Inside, we've got super advanced cooling systems that keep us comfy despite the scorching temperatures. We surf on streams of molten lava, safely of course, and explore the volcanic landscapes. Pretty exciting, isn't it? But still, how about moving to a more friendly environment? Like Mars. Moving to Mars is one of our biggest goals. Its surface is a colorful canvas with hues of brown, gold, and tan. It's covered in rusting iron, regolith, which is like Martian soil, and dust. We would also be surrounded by volcanoes, impact craters, crustal movement, and mighty dust storms. As we gaze into the sky, we're greeted by Phobos and Deimos, Mars's moons. The sky itself is hazy and painted in shades of red and becomes blue during the sunset, opposite to what we have on Earth. The temperatures on Mars can be quite extreme. Sometimes it's as mild as a comfortable 70 degrees Fahrenheit, while at other times it plunges to bone-chilling lows of around negative 225 degrees Fahrenheit. But once again, let's assume that our bodies have adapted to handle these swings. We've also developed ways to safeguard ourselves from meteorites and asteroids. These guys will be our frequent guests. The thin atmosphere of Mars doesn't provide much protection from them. Out of all the planets, Mars would be the easiest one for us to adapt to. Our next candidates, though, are not that hospitable. Living on Jupiter, the gas giant is a whole new level of adventure. Since there's no solid ground to walk on, we've come up with some super cool ways to call this place home. Picture floating cities like gigantic bubbles, suspended in swirling gases and liquids. They're specially designed to withstand extreme pressures and temperatures. To get around, we have jetpacks and hovercrafts. Imagine floating amidst Jupiter's majestic atmosphere, surrounded by cold, windy clouds of ammonia and water. These vibrant stripes and swirls paint the planet with a colorful palette. We zip through the colorful clouds, enjoying a mesmerizing kaleidoscope. Our homes and cities are filled with vibrant colors and shimmering lights. We've even created artificial gravity zones, where we can experience a semblance of gravity and walk with a bounce in our step. But be careful. Jupiter's powerful storms can be intense. Luckily, we have advanced weather prediction technology that keeps us safe. We watch the mesmerizing light shows of lightning dancing across the sky, marveling at the raw power of nature. All this sounds pretty fun, doesn't it? Well, what about the next gas giant, Saturn? Once again, we can live in the skies of Saturn, right among its beautiful rings. Our cities are like big colorful balloons that sparkle and shine with bright lights. Inside, we have large domes where we can freely enjoy everything this incredible planet has to offer. Instead of walking, we use special devices that make us glide through the air, just like on Jupiter. In this extraordinary place, we had to discover new ways to generate power. We use the energy from Saturn's powerful storms. These sources of energy help us fuel our floating cities, giving us the electricity and resources we need to thrive. Saturn has many moons, and each one has its own special features. We've set up outposts on some of these moons, where we can go on exciting adventures and explore their mysterious landscapes. But if living on a gas giant wasn't challenging enough, we also have ice giants in our system. 
Welcome to the fascinating world of Uranus. Despite the super chilly temperature of negative 353 degrees Fahrenheit, we've come up with clever ways to make this place livable. To create warmth, we can learn from Earth's greenhouse effect. Like a cozy blanket, we can introduce special gases into Uranus's atmosphere that trap heat. Another idea is to build gigantic mirrors to capture and reflect the sun's heat. But let's be honest, it would be quite a challenge to position all those massive mirrors just right. Our homes are designed to withstand extreme conditions. We use dense fluids like methane, ammonia, and water to build structures that keep us warm and cozy. Our habitats provide shelter from the freezing temperatures outside. We may even discover new forms of life that have adapted to the unique conditions of this icy giant. Now that would be chilling for sure. And finally, we have Neptune. It is the cool and distant cousin of the solar system. Neptune's atmosphere is mostly composed of hydrogen, helium, and methane. There's also no water, only lots and lots of ice. But that's fine with us, right? So it's time to construct habitats. Let's envision another sky city. After all, who doesn't love the idea of floating cities amidst the clouds? Imagine gazing out from your sky city, observing the mesmerizing hues and swirling storms of this ice giant. The vibrant colors of the atmosphere would paint a breathtaking backdrop for our daily adventures. We'd explore the mysteries of Neptune's moons, delving into their icy landscapes and uncovering the secrets they hold. Hey, a world where humans don't need oxygen or water to survive doesn't sound that bad. We'd soar through the skies and roam vast landscapes. The only limits we would have would be the limits of our own imagination. So stay tuned for more captivating what-if scenarios. Hundreds of spaceships take off from Earth's surface and head toward Mars. Fast forward seven months, and this space fleet of ships is near the red planet. Soon they will all land, and a few thousand people will become citizens of Mars. Perhaps they will never return to their home planet, because there will be absolutely all conditions for a comfortable life here. It takes time and many expeditions to create a self-sustaining colony on Mars. Here is how, step by step, people might build a full-fledged city there, with factories, hospitals, apartment buildings, and even clubs and restaurants. First, we need to pick a time to launch the rocket. A launch window opens once every 780 days. That's when the distance between Earth and Mars is the shortest. In this case, the journey will take about 6 to 7 months. Let's move to the launch pad. Here, we see the spacecraft connected to a booster rocket. Ignition! The booster sends the spacecraft into the air. It then undocks and lands back on Earth. At the same time, the spacecraft's engines start, and it makes its way to Earth's parking orbit. To make this ascent, the ship has used almost all its fuel and now needs refueling. To do this, we use our booster again. A huge crane places another spacecraft on the booster. There are huge fuel tanks inside the ship. The booster launches from Earth and takes the refueler into orbit. It docks with the spaceship and fills it with fuel. The journey through space may need a total of five such refuelings. And for the first mission to build a colony on Mars, we need five spaceships. So that's about 25 launches from Earth. Considering that the booster cost $230 million, the refueler $130 million, and the ship itself is $200 million, the price tag on the mission is pretty impressive. So, ignition. Fast forward in time, and the first five ships descend to the surface of Mars. These ships haven't brought the first humans. They carry only payloads, like fuel and water supplies, oxygen for breathing, and medical supplies. There are also first living modules, waste management systems, and a huge number of solar panels for generating electricity. Before landing, one of the ships launches a system of satellites into orbit. It'll provide communication on the red planet. So, the robots begin their work on Mars. First, a whole bunch of little rovers line up and unfold solar panels. Their total area reaches the size of seven soccer fields. They're much less efficient on Mars than on Earth. Frequent sandstorms fill the working surface of the panels with sand. But at the same time, the strong winds of the red planet also help to wipe the sand away. 
Other rovers, equipped with powerful drills, begin searching for water in the Martian soil. When they find water, people will begin producing fuel. We'll combine carbon dioxide from the atmosphere with the mined water at a high temperature and under high pressure. It'll result in getting methane for rockets and oxygen for breathing. Since February 2021, Mars Perseverance rover has been testing the technology for oxygen extraction. It has a box inside. This is the Mars Oxygen IRSU experiment, also called MOXIE. This thing pulls Martian air inside and then, under high pressure, takes one atom of oxygen from carbon dioxide. Such a thing, about the size of a shoebox, can provide enough oxygen for one astronaut to breathe. But if you build the same mechanism but the size of a large factory, it'll produce oxygen for an entire colony and release the rest into the atmosphere of Mars. Another group of rovers is working to turn the surface of Mars into a landing zone to prepare for the next step in colonizing the Red Planet. By this time, the robotic population of Mars has been working on these tasks for two years and two months, and people on Earth have been waiting for a new flight window to open. This time, not five, but 12 spaceships are coming to Mars. Ten of them are cargo ships, which bring construction materials, fuel, and other supplies, as well as a lot of scientific equipment and 3D printers. Two other ships carry the first interplanetary astronauts. The doors of the spaceships open, and 30 heroes set foot on the surface of Mars for the first time in history. These people are scientists, engineers, and doctors. They have undergone a strict selection and long training to become the first people to conquer another planet. And these guys don't have a return ticket. They'll have to stay on Mars for two years. The astronauts live right in their spaceships and try to get used to the unusual conditions on Mars. The temperature here is about minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, the gravity on Mars is two and a half times weaker than on our home planet. That means a person here can jump twice as high and lift heavier objects. But the muscles in human bodies have a hard time getting used to such a difference. So astronauts can't work full time. The first thing they do is unload cargo ships and deploy life support systems. Some people are experimenting with turning Martian soil into material for 3D printers. Others are setting up greenhouses and cultivating soil to grow plants. The human waste recycling system the robots brought here is used to make fertilizer for plants. Two more years and two months have passed. We see a launch of a spaceship, not from Earth, but from Mars. The 30 astronauts have completed their mission and are on their way home. It's easier for spaceships to take off from Mars because the gravitational force here is less powerful. At the same time, ships are launched from Earth. They'll bring nearly 100 new inhabitants and even more cargo to Mars. When this space fleet arrives at the Red Planet, the astronauts can taste the first food grown here. 3D printers begin building homes on Mars. They print outer shells from Martian soil and plant waste. These shells will protect the dwellings from solar radiation and strong winds. And inside the shells, people will build permanent houses. They're inflatable and are equipped with modules brought directly from the spaceships. These houses have living bays, research bays, and communication centers. The construction goes on for two more years until the next flight window opens again. Some astronauts leave Mars, but more and more people come here with every new mission. They no longer live in spaceships. There are comfortable underground houses and 3D printed shelters. Most of the food is already produced on Mars. A new generation of robots works together with farmers. Other robots help to build even more houses to accommodate the ever-increasing human population. Two more years have passed. Various space agencies launch their missions to Mars. There are more people, more scientific equipment, and even tanks with fish. In 2035, Mars and Earth are at a record short distance. So people send a huge fleet of ships with astronauts and construction materials. By this time, the human colony looks like a small city with many interconnected domes. Its inhabitants have already begun building an underground network of tunnels to move between houses, laboratories, and factories. They've also built the first hospital. Two years later, the population of Mars reaches the 1500 mark. Almost all of these people will become permanent residents of the planet. Four years and two more launch windows later, the first restaurant opens its doors. Also, the construction of a nuclear power plant begins. Once it's finished, the Martians will no longer need constant supplies from Earth. From above, the colony looks like a small town. There's a farming section where food is grown, a living section, and a factory district. 
And with each new mission, people bring more and more solar panels. Now their total area equals dozens of soccer fields. All this allows the astronauts to feel at home. They also don't have to wait for food supplies from Earth. 20 years of the human colony on Mars. Its population is now about 30,000 people. Workers begin to bring their families to Mars. The first schools are built here. 30 years. The population is already over 100,000 people. The colony's infrastructure allows it to be completely self-sufficient. People produce enough food, get enough fuel and oxygen. Around this time, the first plants start growing in Martian soil. There's more and more oxygen in the planet's atmosphere. The trees planted in greenhouses contributed to this. The greenhouse effect from all the human activity helps warm up the surface of Mars, if only a bit. People still have to wear spacesuits when they go outside. It will take many more years until people will be able to breathe on Mars like they do on Earth. Gradually, rivers and lakes will appear. Green plants will cover most of the land. And then the inhabitants of Mars will be able to go outside without an oxygen helmet and call the red planet, now green, their home.